Bonjour à toutes et tous, ça nous fait vraiment plaisir de vous accueillir. Je me présente, Carole Jabé, directrice scientifique pour le Fonds Recherche Québec Santé et je suis accompagnée de Cécile Petitgan, que vous connaissez très bien, qui nous accompagne toujours dans ces événements concernant les, les données. Donc, petit mot d'introduction qui, j'espère, ne sera pas très long, mais je voulais quand même prendre quelques minutes, premièrement, pour vous dire notre plaisir de, de reprendre ces, ces webinaires qui concernent la mobilisation responsable des données de santé à des fins de recherche. Et je pense que celui-ci est vraiment fort à propos euh, aujourd'hui, puisque nous sommes en train de discuter au Québec du projet de loi 3, dont l'intention est de moderniser nos conditions d'accès aux données de santé, en, établissement, en établissant, on espère, un juste équilibre entre la protection des renseignements personnels et une utilisation qui soit responsable, mais efficiente et transparente des données, notamment à des fins de recherche. On l'a mentionné à de multiples reprises dans les mémoires, dans les événements qu que nous organisons. Il est extrêmement important pour nous de ne pas fonctionner en silo, mais au contraire, de travailler en accord avec les meilleures pratiques qui sont adoptées ailleurs dans le monde. C'est ainsi qu'on a produit notamment des recommandations, par exemple pour assurer le bon fonctionnement d'un centre d'accès aux données pour la recherche au sein d'un organisme public, document qui est vraiment important, je vous le rappelle, et qui rassemble les meilleures pratiques mondiales. I will repeat in English for the benefit of our guest. This webinar is very timely as we are discussing Bill 3 project in Quebec, the intention of which being to modernize our conditions of access to health data by striking the right balance between privacy and responsible but efficient and transparent use of data for research purposes. As we've mentioned, on different tribunes, events, reports, it is extremely important not to operate in silos, but to work in line with best practices elsewhere in the world. For example, we've produced a recommendation for well-functioning research data access center in a public organization. This is an important document that brings together best practices worldwide. Another example, we've established a very tangible partnership with the French Health Data Hub with the aim to join, of jointly strengthening the use of health data for research, in particular by promoting collaboration between the players in the data health ecosystem around projects which a strong potential impact on the French and Quebec healthcare systems. We are vigorously pursuing our efforts to establish international links, and it is in this context that we are extremely pleased to welcome our colleagues and certainly friends from the Health Data Research Innovation Institution from UK, the HDR UK. This is a public organization that connects health data sources for research and innovation. The work of this institution spans across academia, healthcare, industry, charities, as well as patients and public. Very intriguing in our Quebec context, where it remains very complicated to connect the dots and to find a way to find the right place for the right mandate for each of the actor actors. So we will discover HDL UK this morning. I would like to thank Paola Catroni, head of the Alliance Strategy and Engagement. Our first contact, she was our first contact in HDR UK, and she generously exchanged with us to understand the mandates of our organizations, to learn about our practices on both sides, and to see how to work together. Thanks also to her for mobilizing her colleagues who are offering their time this morning and this afternoon in, uh, in UK. Today, we will collectively learn more about HDR UK, the organization, the mission in the service of data mobilization, the services to the researchers and other data users, the innovation gateway, this data discovery and access platform, 
we will learn also about the international collaborations and the intent for uh, uh, any uh, international initiatives. Let's be clear here. Our objective at FRQ is to see all together if and how collaborations are possible. So I wish you a very good webinar, but above all, do not hesitate, please, to express your interest. We will make sure to follow up. A warm thank you to the entire HDR Yuki team. A warm thank you to Cecile. You know now that she has a, her own company, Data Lama. Please do not forget. She's organized this event very perfectly as she's always doing, and she will be our facilitator for the session. Paola, I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carol and Cecile, for organizing today. And merci beaucoup à tous. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir uh, d'être ici. And c'est tout. That's my French for today. <laughs> But thank you very much for the great introduction and um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and uh, um, and I'm very I very welcome your words, Carol, in terms of what we can do together to collaborate and to do this uh, together. Because uh, what we will be talking about is really how to do research better and how we can use the assets and the resources that are already available, and they are available because of the people. So I think we'll touch on. A uh, few of these concepts today with all of the people who are going to um, participate in the webinar and thanks to my colleague here today. Um, I'm going to attempt sharing my slides and I'll ask you uh, if you can see them. So can you see my slides? Yes, that's perfect. Yes, I'm going to put them in presenter mode. Can you see them all right? That's perfect. fine. Perfect, thank you. So thank you everyone. Um, as Carol just mentioned, my name is Paola and I'm the head of a, a partnership program which is called the UKL Data Research Alliance. And with me today, uh, we have a few colleagues who will be presenting uh, specific programs. So we have Esther with us who will be uh, talking about patient and public involvement uh, and engagement. Uh, Rosie, who will be talking about capacity building and training and Clara, um, who will be talking about uh, the Innovation Gateway. And finally, we'll have Han, who's Director of Partnerships and Strategic Delivery at HDR Global, who will touch on a specific collaboration uh, and international program that is one of the flagships uh, for HDR UK, and is of particular relevance to this call as well. So uh, I'm going to uh, probably start with a little bit of background because I'm not sure uh, if many know about our data research UK. Um, first of all, um, we are the National Institute for Health Data Science in the United Kingdom, and we have a very ambitious vision that you see uh, there. So our 20 year vision is really for large scale data and advanced analytics to benefit every patient interaction, clinical trials, biomedical discovery and enhance public health. And the mission is in particular to unite the UK health data assets and making sure that this can be used and can be enabled, uh, can enable discoveries that improve people's lives. We are an independent organization that is uh, funded by core funders. And the majority of our core funders, you can see them all here in the slide, are uh, UK organizations or public agencies, apart from the Wellcome Trust, who's also an international funder. And then we have some leverage funds from um, a, a variety of other funders who might specifically fund specific programs. And among those, we have a couple of international funders, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Mineral Foundation. So we have a very big community across uh, the United Kingdom. And as you see here, this is a little map of um, the country where you can see little dots of all of our partnerships that we have so far. And those partnerships really represent uh, some research locations where we have uh, uh, um, researchers and users of the data who are actually doing the research themselves, but also our data research hubs who are specific organizations providing services for data research and data science and training locations where we have some masters and PhD. We have also a central team office that is in central, uh, in central London in the UK, and uh, we're quite small, but we are uh, kind of dispersed all over uh, the UK with this setup that is a virtual setup. 
So our aim and our role is really to kind of take on any opportunity to harness diverse data. And when I say that, I mean that basically uh, one of the main things that we uh, try to do is really to uh, act on our convener role of getting partners from across different geographies and sectors and unite diverse health-related data. We are about four and a half years old, so we're a very young organization, and we are about to enter the next five years because we just received um, funding for the next five years. And it is fair to say that for the first uh, few years, we are concentrating on health data and looking at how we can really maximize the power of health data. But as you see on this graph here, obviously data sets are quite diverse. We go from environmental and social data to genetic and genomics. And then different sectors as well, not just healthcare, but also government and charities as well. So we think that now we need to concentrate on the, the bigger spectrum of data and we consider how we can perhaps link non-health data to health data as well and really maximize the power of that um, resource. The ultimate goal is really to create health and care impact on a larger scale. But as you can imagine, if we are talking about using data for research, for innovation, or for insight, or for patient care, we have the patients at the, at the core of everything, really. And so patient and public involvement and engagement at HDI UK is really key. I think it, what we've been doing since inception, since the beginning, is the beginning of HDI UK, is really to make sure that we are partnering with patients and the public and that, the part, and that they are really partners in also the decision making. So we do have a public advisory board that advises on our strategy, and we want to make sure that the patients and the public do take um, um, do have a voice and do take and do participate in all of the work that we do. First of all, decision making, as you see here, and that we want to listen to their needs and interests, and making sure that um, the public um, uh, the public view is embedded in the work that we do. We want to earn the trust of the patient and the public and the society, but we also want to have people excited about the idea of data being used to generate insights. So that is particularly important, and I really wanted to focus from the beginning uh, of the talk, because we will go through uh, different technology, uh, infrastructure programs, standards, etc. But actually, this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to improve uh, lives um, and, 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 and the society in general. So. Um, this graph here shows our strategy, which has been uh, just refreshed now as we went through um, a phase of review uh, in the past year or so. And what we're focusing here is basically three main integrated areas of activity. We have a program that is particularly focused on the research data infrastructure and services. Another program or a set of programs that is focused on research driver projects. And then the partnership, and which we call institute partnerships, where we really are looking at uh, community working together. And so if we go a little bit uh, into one of each um, of these three streams of work, in terms of the partnerships, I kind of touched on a little bit earlier. As I said, we are based in central London, but we are a virtual institute from across the UK. We have strong regional networks in the UK we are working on, um, and these are across the four nations of the UK. And again, uh, we should be one country, but we can see that each of the different regional networks do things differently. So the idea is that we partner together to do things in a more streamlined way. Um, we have a very well established uh, partnership with the National Health Service. But again, being four different nations, the different national health, research, uh, health services uh, in the UK are slightly different. So what we're trying to do is bringing them together to align and to make sure that we can um, have a system that is more efficient. And finally, we have international partnerships and HDR Global is what Anne will talk about later. And so I, I won't go into detail at this point, but it's just to say that while we are looking at the UK and our regional networks and, and partners, etc., we are now um, doing exactly what Carol mentioned, trying to collaborate internationally so that we align in what we're doing, because if you think about research, it's global. Uh, we, we don't need to put barriers there. We actually want to do things that um, are uh, the basics are the same and similar to all of the other countries as well. We're all working for the same aim in the end. In terms of research driver programs, I just wanted to mention the different topics of, of the research programs that we have um, ongoing. 
One is about molecules to health records, so is about underlining causes of diseases. One is about inflammation and immunity and respiratory diseases in particular. One is about medicines in acute and chronic care, so it's about using prescribed medicines, for instance. One is about social and environmental determinants of health, and so here the, the topic is really that non-health data linked to health data, how do we do that? Then we have pandemic, pandemics and outbreaks, very topical at the moment, as you can imagine, and then big data for complex diseases, so such as cardiovascular or cancer, and some of the main uh, topics that we covered there. But the idea of these research driver programs is really that those programs can use the infrastructure for data that is present in the UK, and they can demonstrate how can they can improve that infrastructure. So it's about using the data and also inputting and providing uh, suggestions for how to improve that infra infrastructure. And that leads me to um, the, the third strand of the work that we do, which is the research data infrastructure and services. And this is a, a little bit of a complicated slide, I, I, I agree if you're thinking that, uh, but it's really just to show that we, um, the research data infrastructure and services of Health Data Research UK cannot work if we don't have the partners working with us. So um, in the UK, there are many researchers and innovators, many of the public and patient contributors, many practitioners and clinicians, and many policy makers, and many, many data custodians. So what we're trying to do is bringing them together in an alliance of data custodians and decision makers, et cetera, to actually agree on the minimum standards for a research data infrastructure service that need to work for, for, for the benefit of the patient ultimately. So um, we work uh, through work streams and we have four uh, work streams that are ongoing at the moment. One is the technology services ecosystem. And this one is the one that includes anything around uh, creating uh, requirements for tools, analytics, the innovation gateway platform, which we'll talk about later, is about how to discover data, etc. And so is again, bringing the community together to input on what technologies are needed for the infrastructure. One stream is trust and transparency. And that is something that Esther will talk about later, but is very much focused on the public and patient involvement, but also the governance, information governance for providing access to data. It's quite complex and we want to make it less complex. The third stream is usable data, and that uh, it refers to data standards, data interoperability, and the rules of how to curate data, because we need to make sure that data can be usable for research. And in that one, there's something around uh, clinical trials as well. And finally, capacity building, which is something that Rosie will talk about later, because obviously we need to have the underpinning skills to be able to use the infrastructure. So these are the four main things that we're working on in terms of the infrastructure. But as I said before, HDI UK cannot do this if the decision makers don't buy in on the rules of the infrastructures, let's say. And so to do that, what we have done is creating this partnership, or alliance, as we say, uh, which is an alliance of um, healthcare and research organizations that are united to establish best practice around the ethical use of health data for research and innovation. And so these organizations have data to share and they already share data in different ways. What they do when they join this alliance is agreeing that things need to be improved and streamlined and they want to use the standards that are commonly accepted. And so that's what the work that we're doing. We're looking at common standards that they can use and implement. And just very, very quickly, just to say why the alliance was created is really to build community, first of all, and capacity and connectivity with a four nation approach. So making the things that are that complex, a little bit less complex and more standardized to unite the UK health data assets, because we have so many resources all across the countries. We want to make sure that, that, that people know where to find the resources, people know where to, what data is available and how you can, you can, uh, you can access the data itself. And then also the Alliance is helping drive development of standards. So sometimes we develop new standards if they're not there, but if there are standards that are accepted, we work on the implementation of the standards or adoption of the standards. And finally, we want to use the Alliance to demonstrate trustworthiness in the use of health-related data through public involvement. 
because all of these alliance members, when they join the alliance, they also have an interest in get, in earning uh, public trust and also in involving and engaging the public themselves. So it's not just our remit, it's really their remit as well. And, and here in the, in the little uh, chart, we can just see the variety of organizations who are in the alliance. We have national public agencies, like the major agencies that have electronic health records or medical records. We have also academic centers. We have many hospital trusts and they have different sorts of data. Sometimes it's accessible, sometimes it's not accessible. And then data science centers or medical charities. In the UK, we have large charities that have databases or re registers um, that are very useful for research and they can provide access to that data. And finally, as part of the Alliance, we also have the Health Data Research Hubs, which are centers of excellence. Uh, and the difference um, perhaps with some of other data custodians is really that they have partnerships with industry and they also provide uh, services for researchers, both the data access services or data, data curation services. And some of these hubs might be uh, more uh, like um, around a specific uh, area of work, for instance, the cancer, the pain data, uh, the pain um, hub uh, or the mental health, they're thematic depending uh, on the hub itself. So in terms of the main work that we've been doing, and I'm, I, I touch on two specific streams here, is the technology one and the interoperability one. Um, we are helping shape standards and influence policy with the Alliance members in particular. And one of the things that I wanted to mention in this talk uh, uh, that, that might be of interest and we can take questions afterwards or, or I can be contacted afterwards is really this shift um, of concept from using data that is uh, extracted or shared um, to actually using data that is in a safe environment. And so moving from data sharing to data access. So with the work of the data custodians, what we've done is publishing some requirements or initially a, a white paper. So uh, just principles for trusted research environments and best practice that has been then taken on from, um, from, from our community of the Alliance has been taken on by others as well. And so now it's actually a policy at the UK government level because there has been a recent investment on looking at secure data environments for health and social care data. And those are policy guidelines that now are being implemented and invested on. And, think, and I think in the United Kingdom, there is a shift from data sharing to data access that is also replicated elsewhere outside uh, the United Kingdom. That is considered as well. And just this is the example that I wanted to show. We went from preparing some best practices from our network of the Alliance to actually informing UK policy and investment to finally informing the European policy uh, that is now uh, being um, worked on uh, through the Health Data Space project. So again, thinking about having trust research environments around uh, across Europe that can be linked and can be federated. So the researchers go to um, the actual uh, safe environments. And again, this is just an idea that I'm putting there to understand how it's also going in other countries. And then finally on the standards, just to mention that one of the things that we're investing on as an alliance and as infrastructure services is really looking at uh, how we can um, recommend data standards in our data research. And one of the example is here is about encouraging organizations to map uh, their source data to common data models. And the one that we are showing here is the OMOP common data model. And this is done through a partnership. There was an international partnership, uh, a European one in this case, uh, when we had partnered with the uh, EDEN network, the European Health, he Health Evidence Network, to actually um, make sure that we encourage standardization across Europe. So we started from the UK, they are coming from a, a European perspective, and we are aligning there with them. It's, it's just an example of partnership that we would uh, be happy to embark on with, with, with others uh, on the data standards piece. And finally, I think I'm going to stop there, but just to leave this slide there, that is kind of, this was a summary slide to summarize the first four years of, uh, of HDI UK on the infrastructure services side of things. Just to say that basically we are now moving into the next phase and we are building on the work that has been done so far. And so we have done a lot on the policy side and the main success was the trust research environment influence. 
uh, on uh, the research projects, for instance, over 500 were supported by the hubs in particular, the membership in the alliance, in the community building has been uh, quite a good success. And then the innovation gateway has been one of the other things that we have produced in the first four years that is going through quite a lot of development at the moment. Uh, Clara will go in, into detail, uh, I think, after me. And I'm going to uh, pass on to the next speaker that I think is Esther. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, um, Paolo. Um, so as part of this session, I will briefly introduce uh, some of the data access governance challenges that HDI UK is focusing on as part of information governance and provide a few examples on how we embed the public in our work. So I will start straight with the challenges that many of you may have already come across, challenges that have been documented in several surveys and relate to data access governance. Researchers cite often the difficulties in obtaining access to the data, and that seems to represent one of the primary blockers to research productivity. The lack of robust, transparent, standardized, and accessible processes, in addition to the lack of guidance and training, appears to cause significant delays in data sharing and linkage. Data access application and approval processes appear to vary quite a lot across data custodians, and that can slow things down and you know, be difficult to navigate. One of the things to look forward is then simplifying and streamlining data access governances, as this has the potential to speed up a research process, in addition to supporting, of course, researchers and enabling research that improves lives. Next slide, please. The challenges as well as their complexities are not new and definitely have global scales that are not just limited to HDI UK. However, as already acknowledged by the Academy's call on G7 nations in 2021, there is an opportunity now to act upon the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is certainly something that HDI UK and not only is focusing right now to unlock the power of responsible, trustworthy health data research. Next slide, please. Foundation of the Pan-UK Data Governance Steering Group is an example. This group represents data custodians and policy makers across the four nation, Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales, and it is a subgroup of the UK Health Data Research Alliance, which was introduced just earlier by Paola. The action forces of this group aim to design and promote innovative and streamline data app governance approaches to ensure faster and more predictable access to data in trusted research environments. Next slide, please. However, fulfilling this ambition and promote meaningful change entails the need for building trust with the public. The subject of data as a daily news headline, good or bad, news stories and courage of the pandemic have meant that data as a concept has quickly become part of our consciousness. The messages are clear that people's data are being gathered, stored, shared, and used. However, they really explain how and for what purpose. And this often results in negative news coverage, misunderstandings, reactions from campaign groups, and ultimately, people mistrust and lack of confidence in health data. So this is one of the many reasons why it is crucial that HDI UK, we do embed members of the public and engage with them in our work. Next slide, please. Earlier in Paolo mentioned the key goals that HDI UK has to ensure that we promote meaningful patient and public involvement and engagement. And I'm aware that across fields and across countries, terminology as well as practice might be different. So I want to stress that what, what we mean actually for involvement and engagement. So involvement in research um, carried out with or by members of the public. So this means that members of the public are actively involved in the development, running and management of health data research process, project. Engagement is when information and outcomes obtained from the research is made accessible to the wider public and provided to them in different ways of dissemination. So one of the key things to remember is that involvement and engagement differ from participation, which entails the inclusion of people in a study as subject of the research, such as in a clinical trial. Next slide, please. 
We discussed earlier about the challenges characterizing data access, and it is interesting actually to discuss the matter from the perspective of patients and the public. What do they want to see when it comes to data access processes? Well, members of our public advisory board carried out a survey in 2021 investigating the data access processes across the then members of the alliance referred to by Paula in the introduction. And building on fundings from this survey, they developed a set of recommendations to ensure public confidence and trust in the use of health data for research and innovation. This recommendation, which is at the phone one within the four categories shown in the slides, were developed keeping researchers and data custodian in mind. But at the same time, members of our board stressed out that it's really crucial that policymakers are aware of them too, as highlighted in one of the opinion pieces that the then chair of the Public Advisory Board wrote in response to the UK government announcement of a review on the efficient and safe use of health data. Next slide, please. However, there are other ways in which we involve patients and the public. And another example is the Coalice study, which is carried out in partnership with the British Health Foundation Data Science Centre. The study's primary aim is to provide local government with information necessary to improve COVID-19 vaccine uptake and coverage. The Coalice team includes members of the public from across the UK nations and has an actively involved patient and public involvement and engagement group across the whole process. So very much from shaping the research question to prioritizing data set and getting involved in the engagement. Next slide, please. So far, we have discussed a couple of examples of how we involve members of the public and patients in L data. Here are a few examples on how we promote engagement across the Institute. So encouraging members of the public to write blogs in an accessible languages, for instance, on trusted research environments, promoting online campaigns such as the Data Saves Lives or A to Z L campaign to help demystify health data research and promote understanding of its impact and value. And at the same time, working with them to create accessible infographics. Many members of our public advisory board and, all, and other public uh, contributors have helped us working towards the development of best practice guidance, getting also involved in the PEDRI initiative. Next slide, please. So the PEDRI initiative, PEDRI stands for Public Engagement in Data Research Initiative, is a sector-wide partnership that recognizes the need to ensure meaningful involvement and engagement across the data system. And the way they're trying to contribute to the current lack of guidance is actually trying to create best practice standards and recommendation for the wider research community. This work is still under development and you can find more online, but this is another way in which actually members of the public actually contribute to our work in a wider sense. Thank you all for listening. I think I will pass it on to Rosie now. Maybe if it's okay for you, you can take some question from the chat. I don't know, Paula, if you want to turn your camera on. Or do you want to, to go on and just looking at the time? Sorry, it took a while to unmute. Um, maybe we get um, Rosie's slides up and then we can take questions if that's okay. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Hi, um, hi everyone. My name is Rosie Wake, and I head training at HDR UK. Um, I am. Um, I don't know if Cecile, did you want to do questions now before I speak, or shall I? I think you can, can go on. I'll go on. Okay. Um, well, thanks everyone for having me. Um, as I said, my name is Rosie Wakeham, and I'm going to speak to you today about the training and career opportunities that we offer at HDR UK and how we support health data science careers, both at the outset and with continued professional development. Um, as um, people move forward with their careers. Um, so next slide, please. Oh, actually, no, sorry, you're, you're fine as you are. Thanks, Paula. So the demand for data, skilled data scientists has never been higher. So we're working to help meet this challenge with several programmes, including our free and flexible online learning environment, Health Data Research Futures, which I'm going to talk to you about in more detail later. Um, as well as Futures, um, we run educational programmes, including the HDR UK Turing 
Welcome PhD programme, which aims to develop future leaders in health data science. Our master's scholarships offer a strong foundation into the career of health data science, and we support apprenticeships, which offer alternative routes into the field. Our internship programmes, the Black Internship Programme and Biomedical Vacation Scholarship, help address underrepresentation in health data science. Okay, so if uh, we can move on to the next slide, thanks. So on to futures, Health Data Research Futures is a free of charge online learning environment. And once you've signed up, you have access to a growing library of CPD accredited short or bite-sized videos with tutors spanning NHS, academia, industry, charities, and all working at the forefront of health data science. Videos are organized into learning pathways, which take the user through a given topic in an easily digestible way. Next slide, please. So Futures allows you to learn in your own time and has several personalized features, ensuring you get the most out of the platform. A personalized welcome page allows you to immediately see your progress and you can add to and follow video playlists. You can search for training based on your interests or learning needs, join communities and be recommended training based on your previous activity and you can see what's most popular on the platform. It contains quizzes to assess your learning and you can earn badges and certificates for completed courses. Next slide, please. In addition to futures, we also run live training events, including workshops and webinars. And you can see here some upcoming live events that are in the calendar. Several of the live workshops are simultaneously being created into online self-directed courses, which will be hosted on um, the HGIK Futures platform. So more people can benefit from them who do not attend the live sessions. Next slide, please. In addition to training events, we aim to raise awareness about the rewarding careers which exist in health data science and inspire more people to pursue a career in the field. We have a series of career profiles of, um, of our bite-sized video subject matter experts on our website, along with interviews carried out with other practicing health data scientists on their careers, including a series of interviews with women working in health data science. In addition to online courses, oh, sorry, could you go back a slide, please? Thank you. In addition to online courses, coming soon will be a signposting portal, which will allow Futures users to search through a directory of training courses offered by HGI UK, but also its partners and external organisations. Users will be able to apply filters based on their interests and what they're looking for, and be directed out via a link to the respective website to find out more and book. It's all designed to simplify and speed up the process for searching for training, and to help practising and aspiring health data scientists find the specific training that suits them. Next slide, please. So before I finish, just a very quick slide on who our training partners are. Um, we consult a wide range of stakeholders to harness the ex their expertise um, to assess the needs of the health data science community and keep informed of what other training is going on in the sector. Next slide, please. So that, that brings my section to a close. I believe the relevant links are being shared in the chat, but if anyone is quick and has their phone out already, um, do feel free to scan the QR codes here to sign up to our monthly newsletter, our LinkedIn page, and also to the Futures platform where you can sign up. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks a lot, Paolo and Rosie, for a really rich, inspiring presentation. We had some questions before we, we go to the next uh, part of the webinar. And I start with uh, the one, I think it's directed to you, Paola, because you talk about... Uh, global, HDR global, and the connection you have with Europe through Eden and the Armour model. But there is one question about your collaboration with European Health Data Space. So despite the Brexit, how do you connect with uh, your European neighbours? Very good question. And thank you. Thank you for asking the question. Um, so the short answer is definitely we are uh, trying to collaborate as much as possible with European uh, members as well and in particular for the European health data space as well. So there is a, um, a specific, um, let's say, initiative in the UK, which is called the Towards, uh, Towards the European Health Data Space. And we are part of that uh, network itself. So we are already collaborating with them and we are participating as a contributor on, on the principles and policies that they are writing for the European health data space. And uh, yes, despite Brexit, I think uh, likely the UK government has guaranteed uh, some funding uh, to replace that for the next few months. So at the moment, we are still eligible to apply for Horizon Europe um, in the next few months. This is the status right now. Obviously, we don't know how it's going to play out later on. But so there is scope for collaboration, and which is good. 
Thank you. We have a next question. I don't know, Carol, if you want to ask a question, don't hesitate. Uh, this is one from uh, Audrey. She's really thanking you for the inspiring presentation. And she's uh, talking about the sensitivity of uh, the secondary use of health related data. So could you talk a little bit about how HDR UK navigate this issue and how its inception was made possible at a national scale, for example, for the role of the NHS related to protect data? So, so the issue of ge the general issue on national scale of actually um, how it is possible to access data on a national scale, that's the question I believe. Yeah, and how you connect centres, you know, the issue of not sharing data but making access global. Okay, so um, so this is something, so as, as I mentioned before in terms of uh, we, we, in the UK we have four nations. In the four nations, there is a national health service that provides the different services, and part of those services are around research. So all of the different uh, national health services host particular data that can be potentially used for research and innovation. What we've been doing is kind of influencing um, the way uh, or, or the mechanisms for providing the access to data um, so that we advocated for data access rather than data transfer and, and extraction of data. And so I think what, how we've done it, we've done it with the Alliance uh, specifically. What we've done is kind of creating that community of data custodians who were willing to improve their processes and coming together on uh, deciding the basic data standards. And I think that helped getting the right voices in both from the public agencies and also from the smaller scale data custodians to underpin the basic um, kind of rules underpinning that. And, uh, and I think a lot of partnership with National Health Service specifically to actually influence uh, the policy, the underlying policy. And I think that has led a little bit to informing the, the, the future investment that we have, especially in England. But that is still a work in progress in terms of data access in, uh, in, in trust research environments across the UK, um, because there are every every organization is at a different level of maturity. So some organizations have already a trust research environment, some organizations don't have that trust research environment. So it's still a work in progress. It's not yet on a perfect national scale um, uh, of that level. Perfect. Just concerned with the time, Paula. So uh, maybe I'll take one more question before your, your colleagues go on, and you can feel free to answer the question by typing uh, answer the question by typing the answer in the Q and A box. But the last one will be regarding uh, data standards. So how does the development of standards and environments within the alliance align with other initiatives such as GA for GH, uh, Elixir, etc. Yeah, so we are definitely collaborating with them as well. And, and the GA4GH actually was one of the alliances that inspired the, the setup of the UKL Data Research Alliance. So looking at the standards. So we're working with the GA4GH on the passports for um, uh, researchers to access safe environments. So that's one area. And on the Elixir, we also looked in, in the Elixir because there is an Elixir UK node and we are, um, and, and actually the director of the Elixir UK node is within our network as well. So we're very much looked in in those collaborations as well. Thank you very much. So that was the first section and then we can go on to the section uh, that would be presented by Clara Fennessy. So Clara is a project manager in infrastructure services, and she's going to talk about HDA Innovation uh, Gateway. So this platform that's so fascinating to me and to all of us here, I think. So Clara, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Cecile, uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to spend the next part of the presentation talking about the Innovation Gateway, the key features and services that it has, and uh, how you can find out more, of course. Um, so the Innovation Gateway was set up in 2020 as a common entry point for researchers and innovators to discover and identify UK health data sets and related health data assets. Um, so why was it set up? Well, prior to this, um, it was very difficult for researchers to find uh, UK health data that was most suitable for their studies or projects, um, as UK health data is maintained and managed in lots of different organisations across the UK. Uh, and it's also all described in different ways. Uh, the gateway itself doesn't hold any patient data at all. 
Uh, it simply lists and describes health data sets available for research. And it also acts as a communication platform between uh, custodians of those data sets and uh, researchers. Um, I've put a QR code uh, there on the right hand side, um, obviously if you've got your phone please do scan it, uh, and we've also got the link at the top and um, my colleagues will also be posting uh, the links as we go through. Next slide please Paula. So as I mentioned the gateway was established around three years ago and it has grown from strength to strength in that time. We've got around 800 health data sets listed on the gateway at the minute, and over 3000 other resources such as uh, tools. Uh, courses, data uses and publications. We have over 2000 registered users across the site, making around 10,000 searches per month and that does continue to grow. Uh, obviously in that time we've developed a number of key features and services that support that research journey and I'll go through some of those with you in a second. Um, and again, I've, I've put a QR code to that timeline here. Do go and check that out. It's much more interactive on the website than it is on the slide deck here. So uh, do take a look. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide uh, briefly outlines the key functionality that exists within the gateway. Um, I'll only go through some of these today, mostly because of time, um, but I'll go through our key data discovery uh, services, including the cohort discovery tool and collections. I'll also run through the data access request management module that we have and the data use register as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea behind the functionality you just saw on the previous slide is to, is to support three key areas of the gateway journey uh, from discovery to uh, access and then uh, transparency around how uh, that health data is used. Next slide, please, Paula. Thanks. So I'll start off with the discovery, the, the first step. Um, and there are a number of ways in which researchers can search for data sets on the gateway. Um, the, the, the first type is through using simple search terms, uh, and I've got an example there on the screen for you. Um, so re researchers and anyone can simply type into the search bar. Here I've got an example where I've typed in COVID-19, you can see in the top right hand corner there, and it's brought forward a, a series of results, not just data sets, but also tools, data uses, uh, and other assets that relate to COVID-19. Um, as you can imagine, that brings up quite a lot of results. So what, uh, what you can do is then go ahead and filter and refine your search further. So in this example, I have filtered on the left-hand side, you can see there um, by all data sets related to COVID-19 that are managed by Public Health Scotland, which is the publisher filter you can see on the left. On the right-hand side, you can also see um, other search criteria that you can filter by, such as keywords, phenotype, provenance, and other criteria as well. You can even uh, sort your results uh, even further by uh, those results that closely match your search term or indeed those that were most recently added to the gateway. So clicking on a data set itself looks a bit like this. If you go to the next slide, please, Paula. So I've got two examples here, um, and it's worth noting that all data sets, uh, data set listings uh, look very much the same. Um, so on the left hand side here, we've got an example from NHS Digital. Uh, and you can see the title of the data set in the top left hand corner with the publisher or data custodian listed underneath and then follows uh, some kind of summary level, uh, high level abstract information about the data set. Uh, and then on the right hand side, I've got another data set, but I wanted to show you the other types of metadata or information we collect about data sets. Uh, and that ranges from uh, time lag, from geographical coverage to follow up and access information and so on and so forth. One other thing I also wanted to highlight here was in the top right hand corner of each data set, I've highlighted it in red on the first NHS digital data set there, there is a score, um, which is a metadata completeness score, uh, it ranges from bronze to platinum, what that means is, is uh, the higher the score, the more information there is available about that data set, um, and therefore more information is available to researchers for them to decide if this is the right data set for their study or, or project. Uh, I'll come back to the how to request access button a bit later, um, but as the, as the name suggests, that provides information on how you can request access to that data set. And again, that exists on every data set inside the gateway. Next slide, please, Paolo. 
So I've gone through how to discover data sets um, using search terms. It's also possible to search for data sets by particular theme uh, or collections. Uh, and so collections, as the name suggests, are, are groupings um, of uh, not just data sets, but also other related health data assets as well. Um, and I've got a couple of examples on the screen there. Um, so staff at HGI UK and data custodians across the UK have brought related health data assets together, sometimes by particular topic. So you can see we have collections related to cancer, uh, as well as those on maternal and child health. Um, but it's also quite common for data custodians to have a collection for themselves um, to basically list all of the data sets that they've got available for research. Uh, again, there's a QR code there on the screen to take to the collection page. Uh, do go and check that out as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the kind of final aspect of discovery that I wanted to talk about uh, was a cohort discovery tool. Um, so the cohort discovery tool was launched in April uh, 2021 in conjunction with HGIUK and a team called Coconut uh, that are in Nottingham uh, in the UK. Um, and the cohort discovery tool enables researchers to determine how many people meet specific research criteria across multiple data sets in the UK. Um, so, for example, a researcher may be interested in patients that are between the ages of 18 and 30 who are non-smoking uh, and who have asthma and diabetes, as an example. Uh, that query is then run across uh, multiple um, pseudonymized data sets, uh, and then the, the tool then returns anonymous summary level responses, basically a count uh, of how many people meet that criteria. And the idea being is that in a matter of minutes, a researcher can find out this summary information without needing to go ahead and ask each individual custodian um, that same question, uh, in essence. So it's also worth noting here that no individual patient data is transferred away uh, from the data custodian at any point. It's all safely behind a firewall. Um, and also data custodians using this tool uh, also set um, minimum count limits and, and rounding figures to prevent any identification from happening as a result of using the tool. Uh, it is uh, primarily at the minute a UK based tool, um, but I have put the QR code there in the middle of the screen um, to take you to the page that uh, explains the tool a little bit more and how it works. So again, please do go ahead and check that out. Next slide, please, Paola. So moving on to the second part of the journey, which is data access. Next slide. Okay, so um, towards the end of 2020, we launched some functionality uh, that enables data custodians to set up an online data access request form uh, that researchers can fill out and request access to their data sets. Um, the form itself adheres to a set standard uh, known as the Five Safes Framework, um, which was established by the Office of National Statistics here in the UK. Um, and essentially, the Five Safes provides assurance that data is being accessed uh, and analysed and used in the most secure and trustworthy way. And the Five Safes themselves are broken down as follows. You can see there in the middle of the screen into safe people. So making sure that only those who have the right training and accreditation are accessing the data, uh, that data is only being used for projects that have a clear public benefit, that the data itself is de-identified, that any settings uh, or systems that are using, that are, uh, will be accessing the data are as secure as possible, and that it's then not possible to go ahead and then identify data subjects once that research has been completed. So we are working with data custodians across the UK to adopt this standard. Uh, through the work of the Alliance that Paola mentioned. Um, but just to show you what that looks like within the context of the gateway, if you could go to the next slide, please, Paola. Great, so um, we've talked through how it's possible to search um, on the gateway for health data sets. It's then possible to make an inquiry with the data custodian, an informal inquiry. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, it's then possible to go ahead and submit a full data access request form on the gateway, um, then the custodian can go ahead and review the application and then make a decision and approval or rejection as required. And I really want to stress here that this whole journey takes place inside the gateway in one platform. 
Um, I've put again a QR code there in the corner to tell you more about the five says framework uh, and how that uh, was established um, a number of years ago. Uh, next slide, please. To show you what this looks like on the gateway, uh, I mentioned that how to request access button earlier on the data sets. So clicking that takes you to a page that looks like the screenshot on the left hand side there. So it's essentially a description of the access process for each custodian when you click on their data set. That blue button that says make an inquiry takes you to a very, very short uh, form that asks the researcher to detail uh, their contact in information, their project, uh, and what data sets they're interested in. It's very, very high level. And this uh, window essentially acts like a chat feature so you can communicate with the custodian all within the gateway. Next slide, please. And then the researcher can go ahead and uh, make a full five safe uh, data access request form. Uh, it looks like the screenshot you can see there on the left. Um, and say it's an online form and you can see the five safes that I mentioned earlier are listed there as headings. It's worth noting here that whilst there are set questions within the form that uh, researchers must complete and the custodians must have in their form, it is possible for custodians to add in their own questions in order to capture other information that they might need for their own access, uh, access processes. Once the application then comes into the custodian, it goes through to a dashboard that, you, that looks like one you can see on the right hand side there. Um, the custodian can then share that application inside the gateway with uh, particular reviewers who have set permissions, and they can then go ahead and make the decisions as applicable. We currently have eight data custodians across the UK, they're listed at the bottom there, who are using the data access request form, um, but obviously we will work with um, other members of the Alliance to increase that number going forward. Next slide, please. So finally, I'll touch on the transparency element of this. Uh, next slide, please. Which is our data use registers. So at the start of last year, um, we launched a standard for data use registers. So um, data use register is sometimes known as a, an approved project list or a data release register. It's essentially a record of how health data is being used, by whom and for what purpose. Um, and it essentially allows uh, researchers and custodians to demonstrate trustworthy access to data. Uh, this content, uh, this um, the standard, sorry, uh, was uh, developed in conjunction with uh, the Alliance, with patients and the public and UK data custodians. It's worth noting that the structure of individual data uses follows the five states framework in line with our access uh, module earlier. And we've also set up some automated processes inside the gateway to help data custodians with this. So for example, when a data access request is approved, it automatically becomes a data use uh, on the gateway. And so that record is being updated continuously as, as approvals come in. So what does this look like on the gateway? Uh, next slide, please. So I've got an example here of what a data use on the gateway looks like. You can see in the top left um, the title of the project itself, and then uh, some further details around who was using the data, the institution they were from, uh, and most importantly, towards the bottom of the screen there, you can see a, a lay summary, a high-level summary of that project, uh, and a public benefit statement as well. Um, I've, again, there's another uh, link there, and, and Claire is kindly posting the links in the chat as well, uh, which will take you to the full list of data use on the gateway. We have well over 800 now, and that continues to grow. Next slide, please. And that uh, concludes uh, my part of the, the presentation. Um, just to flag a couple of things from me, uh, we do have a newsletter that is sent out monthly on the gateway. Um, so please do go ahead and sign up to that uh, to be kept informed of what's going on. I uh, would also recommend that you do go ahead and create a profile on the gateway uh, that will allow you to um, upload content yourself, such as tools and publications. You can do that via the homepage by clicking the sign in or sign up button in the top right hand corner. Uh, and finally, I've included a link to the HGI UK events page. Um, where all of our um, institute-wide events are listed, um, but we do also put any specific webinars or pr presentations in relation to the gateway there as well. So do go and check that out. That's it from me. Um, thank you very much for your time.
Thanks a lot, Clara, uh, for this and congratulations for these accomplishments because you are really impressive for discovery access and transparency and all the support you give to requesters and data custodians. That's really inspiring for our province. How we discuss uh, Bill Free. You know that he's revising uh, the legal uh, aspects of health data access for research. Uh, before turning to Anne to present uh, HDI Global, we have some questions that need to be answered. Thanks, Paola, for answering the question and typing answers as you were turning the slides. That's impressive. Uh, we have one that was uh, actually connected to the previous presentation by Alexandra. So why uh, are health data and genetic data in distinct data set categories? She was asking, I think, Paola. Uh, and is there a different legal regime applicable in the UK regarding these two sets of data? Um, sorry, can I repeat again which data sets? Sorry, I missed Health you. data and genetic data. So we're guessing that you apply different conditions for access or regimes. Uh, if you just can summarize the vision of the UK regarding this. Yeah, no, it's actually a good question because possibly uh, the underpinning rules, let's say, or, or the regulations and the, and the concept of environment is probably similar. So we shouldn't probably put it in different categories. Uh, but I suppose, um, um, I suppose when we mean what we meant in that slide, if it's the one at the beginning, the RNS in the diverse data, if that's a referring, I think by health data there we we probably wanted to stress the importance of electronic health records or records that are routinely collected. And the genetic data not always uh, is in that part of information. So it's not where you have a, your GP practice as a, a, as a routine thing. But in terms of the concept of secure data environments is actually uh, the same security levels. And I would say, for instance, we have initiatives such, such as Genomics England, um, that are uh, with that type of data uh, and they are, are more advanced than perhaps how the health data or routine collected data are managed at the moment. And we are looking at aligning those two. So actually the underpinning secure data environment and the five safe framework that Clara mentioned should be um, standard, should be the same standard to follow. Don't know if that helps. Thank you, Roman. That helps a lot. And the, the connection of the secure environment is also a good example for us to think about access to data. Another question is related to the government support uh, that would be given to you to implement data burn, the infrastructure that you're developing. What is this? What do you receive as resources to go on and develop? Is it for... Clara, Esther, or me? <laughs> it was not addressed to a specific <laughs> panelist, but uh, Paolo, feel free to, to answer. So in terms of the, the governance itself, so um, I think that speaks a little bit to the work that Esther mentioned on the data access in particular. So I, I will pass on to Esther in a minute. But in general, uh, we, the work that we're doing is really looking at the data access processes that are used at the moment across the UK and across the different partners. And we, unfortunately, uh, we are starting from a point where all of the partners use slightly different ways of providing access to data. So we're trying to encourage the use of the five safe framework, uh, which is uh, probably someone who's posted in the chat, is basically almost like a framework that all of the organizations should follow to make sure that data is accessed in a secure way and is, uh, is accessed by people that are secure people in a way that they are accredited or that they, they can access that data. Um, and I guess uh, the type of resources and support that we provide is something that we're trying to look at uh, with the, the trans and transparency work in particular. I don't know, Esther, if you wanted to add anything on that particular uh, resource material side of things. No, I think, Paula, you addressed it quite easily. Um, so as mentioned, the Pan-UK Governance Steering Group is very much what we are focusing on. And main action forces are mapping a standardized way of data access in order to streamline, for everyone's sake, really, the access to data. But at the same time, we're trying to develop some of the toolkits um, that we can help researchers with, such as the trusted British Environments Data Contract Toolkit. So it's very much a work in progress. And I think Paula answered that well. Do you know if there is any other specific question um, on that? Thank you. There are still many questions regarding the gateway, but I'm really concerned about not having enough time to give the floor to Anne. So if it's okay, Clara, I don't know, you can 
try to type answers or people can reach you afterwards to ask specific questions how you organize the gateway, the technical aspect regarding nodes and information that you can give to users. So this is really a, a conversation that we do not want to end on the gateway, but I'm really concerned on giving and the opportunity to present uh, the international perspective of HDR. So Anne Voskraft uh, is Director of Partnership and Strategic Delivery, and she's going to talk about HDR Global. Thanks, Anne, the floor to you. Thank you very much indeed, Cecile. I'm just going to uh, share my screen and ensure that that is in presentation mode. Can everybody see that? That's perfect. Thank you very much indeed. So we come to the last uh, uh, part of uh, the webinar um, and I'm very grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to give an overview of HDR UK's two international programmes. Uh, the first is the International COVID-19 Data Alliance Programme or ICODA and that recently concluded after 30 months and the newly established HDR Global Programme which very much builds on ICODA and on our learnings. So just to begin very briefly uh, by uh, covering and introducing uh, ICODA to you, um, this was an initiative uh, funded uh, predominantly by the uh, COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator and it focused um, on enabling international researchers to use secondary data in a rapid fashion uh, but in a very trustworthy fashion to be able to uh, gather new insights uh, uh, to address research questions that could help manage uh, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, but also to enable uh, an efficient data response to future pandemics and for very much uh, for there to be a legacy uh, that could help uh, in the future. And as I said, the pilot ran from July uh, 2020 and uh, recently ended at the end of uh, 2022. So a really fast uh, uh, program, uh, but we had the privilege of supporting 12 international uh, research teams, a cohort of what we called our driver programs. And they really built and we built in uh, enabling uh, their studies on all of the work and the approach and the principles that HDR UK uh, was already using uh, within the UK, but with that trustworthiness and with that open science approach. So uh, ICODA has very much worked on four pillars and these pillars and, 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 and what they encapsulate will be very familiar to you now from what you've heard uh, from Paula, from Esther, uh, from, from, from Clara and from Rosie. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to work and develop a collaborative open global alliance across different sectors. But particularly for ICODA, we wanted to address the issue of data inequity and for there to be a particular focus on researchers in low and middle income countries. The second pillar, very much in line with HDI UK, was about public and community engagement involvement from the outset in those studies to really build confidence and help shape to ensure that they really brought uh, uh, patient benefit, but also robust and trustworthy governance with proportionate me mechanisms for taking that forward. In terms of en enabling a scale, longevity, but also sustainability, uh, again, building on uh, HDI UK's tools and approaches, uh, we uh, had an instance of the Innovation Gateway specifically for our teams, uh, and that uh, ensured that we could take a fair approach, findable, accessible, interoperable and reproducible approach for the data. And we also provided uh, for our research teams a trusted research environment, um, uh, which was known as the COVID-19 workbench. And this uh, enabled uh, analysis and uh, access, federated access when the data could not be transferred. And last but not least, absolutely core to ICODA, the driver project model 
where those 12 exemplar projects were very strongly research question led and there was an iterative build. They helped us develop the platform, the processes, the policies and the tools that were then openly shared uh, so that um, it was kind of uh, just in time, but it really helped um, take things forward very rapidly. So uh, what about the progress and outputs of the ICODA initiative? You'll see here um, that, you know, the truly global nature of, of the initiative involving 135 researchers from 19 countries, but working with a broad range of data types from over 60 countries and each and every one of them with strong community and stakeholder engagement. I, the other thing I wanted to point out, apart from the wide variety of data um, countries and actually research questions uh, being addressed, uh, the outputs were actually quite broad. So this was not just about the insights, important as those uh, have been, and the publications, but also for us to be able to develop generic policies and processes and templates which are openly available for others to use. Again, it's back to that sustained impact. Many of the projects also developed dashboards, uh, which is still ongoing, that have been used not only by policymakers, but also by the wider public. And that's really done so much to build trust and engagement. Again, the metadata available for reuse and really importantly, that global health data science community practice, which has really grown. I won't take too much time on the next uh, couple of slides um, um, because I know we haven't got much time left and I wish, you know, I'm sure there might be some questions. Uh, but I wanted to give two examples of the driver projects uh, that were involved in the ICODA initiative. Uh, the first led by Dr. Fernanda Bosa in uh, Brazil, in particular uh, area uh, of, of, of Rio. And um, he was uh, addressing uh, the uh, efficacy of a particular vaccine uh, in populations in Brazil and two very different kind of sets of data on, on uh, 43 hospitals um, were involved in, in this study with um, uh, uh, de-identified in individual data looking at health outcomes uh, for hospitalised patients uh, uh, with COVID, but also uh, a fabulous kind of study that worked in the favelas uh, in, in, in Rio, working uh, with uh, community health workers and using mobile phone data and looking at not only the efficacy of vaccines, but also allowing some real time analysis of where there was an inequity in vaccine uh, access. The second is a multi-country uh, research study, one of our driver projects, um, and uh, was actually initiated in Canada. I thought it was a lovely example to share with you. And Dr. Megan Azad and her co-investigators, um, she's at the University of Manitoba. And this research study started with a tweet quite early um, in uh, the pandemic. Uh, where people started to notice that in certain countries at the beginning of lockdown that there, there were reductions in preterm births and also in stillbirths. I wanted to look at whether this was different in different contexts, in different countries, um, and uh, what were the factors that were impacting on it. And ultimately, again, it was really mobilised in a very effective way by uh, the lead uh, PIs and ultimately involved over 42 countries uh, with summary data sets that came from a national, but also at a regional and then with that, a particular health center um, level. Um, and uh, the, the results of this major study are about to be published in uh, Nature uh, for Human Behavior. I thought it might be helpful to include um, a few of the data sharing our 12 research projects and the ICODA core team uh, uh, experience, but also some of the things that helped. Again, I won't go through this in great detail, but just to say 
um, that um, on particular levels, um, you know, the lack of there being no globally accepted data governance models, uh, particularly for those um, those teams uh, that were had multi-country uh, focus. Um, we found it very helpful to work with them on using that same five safes concept, the safe projects, settings, people, data, and outputs. And Clara had a very nice uh, 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 diagram or visual on, but also having very simple and understandable principles and uh, common policies and, and helping and getting the researchers input on that. Again, with minimalization, we use mostly summary level uh, 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 aggregate uh, data for, for the projects. Um, and on data sovereignty, again, particular um, reticence about seeding uh, controllership uh, for data uh, access. Again, this is, you know, it was again focused on data access, not on uh, just on, on, on data sharing in, in, in most cases. Again, it, we piloted uh, putting together agreements for uh, HDR UK to act as a, as a data controller, working closely with one of our international partners. Other lessons learned, international legal regimes um, and, and the difference on that, and again, our input into government-led roundtables, intergovernmental-led roundtables, has been very interested on this and be very happy to, to, to share uh, some of the learnings and the approaches that we, were taken on that. So what's next? So um, uh, about six months ago, uh, we established the successor program to iCODA, HDR Global. Um, and uh, this is first and foremost, very much focused on uh, uh, low resource settings and supporting resource, uh, researchers and health practitioners to be able to uh, uh, enable trustworthy data access, reuse and analysis in regions and communities and areas of global health challenge where the data, the evidence is not there to be able to tackle those threats to public health. And for this program, again, it's not just focusing on COVID-19, but a full range of locally set global health challenges. We're working in a five-way partnership um, led by our Global South partners. Uh, collaborating very closely with the Global Health Network, uh, coordinated from the University of Oxford. Um, our three uh, lead regional partners are Theo Cruz in Brazil for the whole of Latin America, Africa Center for Disease Control um, for the whole of Africa, and ICDDRB in Bangladesh uh, for the whole of Asia. And our foundational program is uh, supported by the Gates Foundation. The objectives and goals of HDR Global, again, about supporting research that tackles locally set priority health ch challenges by improving capture and analysis, but also to address inequity where the data is collected and who actually benefits from that evidence. And last but not least, to connect expertise, build capability, and share the kind of standards technical approaches uh, and policies and solutions that work um, across the different projects and teams across the Global South. Very early in the initiative, uh, we uh, prepared a sort of theory of change, uh, working with our partners and uh, uh, across uh, the Global South uh, to look at what the current gaps are and where uh, the program, the initiative uh, could uh, make most impact and best meet researchers and health practitioners needs. And it came across very strongly, there were three areas. Uh, one on uh, the importance of developing data science capability. Uh, the second about enabling a strong health data infrastructure. And this includes, you know, this trustworthy governance and approach um, and, and last but not least, the, it, the need to engage stakeholders, including policymakers, but importantly, communities, um, patients and, and the public 
um, in research studies uh, from the, the outset to be able to ensure that the insights that come through from taking the data science uh, approaches uh, are, are most impactful. And all of these uh, will be supported or are being supported by Pathfinder projects, very similar to the approach taken with the driver programs and the research driver programs that HDR UK um, are, are running. So this is just a very brief summary of progress to date. Um, we've established a digital global health data science hub on the global health networks uh, site. And we're working with a, a, a very diverse working group uh, of data scientists um, and a, a public representative to look at the resources, uh, the events, the initiatives that are happening through that hub and really helping them to shape and grow the community of practice. Um, and we've also, um, we're working on a, a protocol uh, to look uh, very widely at the identification and reaching consensus on essential health data science skills. And that links uh, to some of the things that Rosie was speaking about earlier. Data infrastructure and governance, we've been doing landscaping and, and, and scoping uh, particular requirements um, and also ensuring that there's a space on the, the hub for signposting relevant resources for community, public and patient engagement, um, all again underpinned by the uh, global um, and regional Pathfinder projects. And here's a quick glimpse at uh, the, the, the hub that I've been uh, mentioning. And that uh, brings us to the end. Uh, I hope that was helpful and I hope I've left enough time for questions. Thank you. And yes, that was really helpful and really inspiring to see how you support global research, but also infrastructure to facilitate uh, data-driven uh, findings and sharing in the global south especially we have some question related to the international perspective and one about the access that's given to international researchers to data in the uk so how do you work in supporting for example canadians or people from quebec in partnering with researchers from the uk yeah that's a, that's a really good question paula may i ask you if you'd like to um, address that question. And can I check, is the one on the um, researchers accessing um, the gateway in particular, right? Or yeah. overall, yeah. yes. So I think the data set in the gateway, I think as um, Clara mentioned earlier, um, are all held by the data custodians. So each of the data custodians will have specific um, uh, rules, let's say, or, or specific mechanisms to provide access to data. So if that will vary from data custodian to data custodian. Mm, I have to say at the moment, the majority of data custodians uh, using the gateway might not grant access to international researchers if they're applying alone. But if they're applying in collaboration with the UK researchers, um, that is possible. But again, that will be different by data custodian to data custodian. And I think at the moment, and Clara can correct me, I think there are a couple of, uh, a few uh, uh, data sets that are actually international data sets, and that will have different rules as well. So I don't know if Clara wants to add anything uh, on that one. No, you've, you've covered it there, there Paola. And, and yes, as mentioned, it's um, each uh, process will be unique per data custodian. Um, the gateway sort of acts as a vehicle for that process. So yes, that'll be down to them. Thanks, thanks Paula. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will take a final question before handing over to Carol Jabe for the conclusion. It's about solidarity. So Anne, you, you talk about how HDR Global is working towards supporting the Global South in major global challenges, but also local ones. And uh, Lise Langbois is the head of uh, an institute for ethics regarding uh, digital innovation and AI is asking about data altruism. So this concept has emerged with the European Health Data Space, and do you, how do you work uh, towards data donation for common good? That's a, a, again a really, really good question. Um, at this stage, I think that we're still working very closely with um, with our partners, particularly our regional partners, about um, 
you know, the mechanisms, the approach that they find uh, most helpful. And I think for them, uh, that what's coming through quite strongly is that the, the sense of being able to use their, their, the, the data that in many cases they, they, they have locally and being able to link up and collaborate in a very equal kind of way. Thanks. Thanks a lot to all of you. And now I'll hand over to Carol uh, to conclude this fantastic webinar. Thanks also to everyone that uh, attended and asked so interesting questions. Merci beaucoup, uh, Cécile. Merci beaucoup, mesdames. You are definitely very uh, amazing representative of uh, HDR. They can be proud of you. You made a fantastic job uh, trying, uh, not trying, I mean, succeeding in presenting what uh, HDR is, uh, is doing. And, and the organization itself is uh, completely uh, uh, impressive and amazing and, uh, and definitely uh, inspiring when we are looking for our road here in Quebec. Uh, based on the, the questions, uh, the number of questions and the quality of questions, and based on the, the materials that was posted in, in the chat, I'm pretty sure that a lot of uh, research teams, leaders here in Quebec will knock on the door and see how they can collaborate with you. I'm, I'm really pretty sure about this. And, and that's great because this is really why we are doing this type of event. So, so uh, uh, hopefully I cross my finger, we will see some uh, outcomes coming uh, from this uh, webinar. Uh, however, I, I would like also to remind to everybody uh, still here uh, now and listening to this, that we also do this type of event to, to find a way to collaborate at the international level to uh, really connect organization between themselves and benefit this type of discussion and exchange to really figure out and set up the best practices on how we can mobilize data and how we can share data. And not only in a country, in a region, but also internationally. So please, and I'm coming to my point, send me any ideas, any follow-up you would like to see on how FRQ can build on this, uh, again, very amazing webinar and make very concrete uh, collaboration we may have to uh, really improve the, the landscape of data mobilization. And I will be more than happy to find a way to do it with the great woman that we, uh, we had this morning. So thanks again, thanks to uh, Cécile. I'm going to switch a little bit in French, sorry, okay? Pardon me, forgive me, but uh, je voudrais aussi remercier nos, uh, nos personnes de communication au FRQ, Julien Chapdelaine, Itisem Dogri, que j'oublie à chaque fois dans ces événements-là et qui pourtant sont uh, les personnes uh, grâce à qui uh, ces événements sont connus et uh, publicisés. Alors, merci uh, à nos personnes de com aussi. Bon vent, bon succès and uh, great collaboration. Thanks again. Thank you.